Good evening, everyone. As you are coming in, I uh, want to say welcome to all of you who are joining us for tonight's session. Uh, we want to say thank you for those that are writing in the chat uh, who you are and what fellowship you're a part of. We want to say thank you again to all of you for being here tonight. We're so glad to be able to come for our second week and discussing uh, Jesus and the Disinherited by Howard Thurman. We had a wonderful time last week and we are looking forward to diving right into this week. So I won't uh, do a lot of preliminary talks because we wanna make sure that we dive right into the text and give us some more time in discussion with our breakout groups. So let us join in a word of prayer. Holy and righteous God, we are grateful for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to wade in the water again, to be able to share in this moment of learning and discussion we pray now for your Holy Spirit to be with us and guide us and direct us, oh God. We ask that you would be in each group, in each session, and in, in the presenters' uh, presentation tonight as we think about who Jesus is, uh, who, what he means to the work of ministry that we're called to do, and how we are called to follow him faithfully. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll now pass it off to Pastor Carla, who will uh, share with us how to best enjoy this session. Again, thank you and welcome to this evening. These are some of the guidelines that we shared with you all last week. Um, and if you're new with us this week, we want to be sure that we all have the same framework here. First, we invite you to be present, to be fully present to this time, whatever it is that that means for you to, to shut off the other phones that you might have around, um, to let go of whatever the rest of your day has been and to be here. To be prepared, this is a book that we're all reading together. So to have digested the material a little bit and to be ready to number three, to participate, to contribute what it is because each one of us brings our own unique life experiences to bear on this study and we're less rich if we don't have your full participation in it. As part of that full participation, we ask that you be willing to listen, to truly Open the ears of your heart and listen to what it is that Howard Thurman is saying, to what your group is saying, to what God's spirit is saying, and to be willing to learn, to know that it's okay to be challenged, to find a different perspective, and to grow. That's what this time together is all about. So we invite you to be pre present, prepared, to participate, to be willing to listen and to learn. And now Pastor Chris is going to lead us into the particular topics for tonight. All right, thanks Carla. Uh, we are uh, digesting chapter two and chapter three tonight and uh, taking some of your feedback from last week, uh, trying to give you more time uh, in your small groups to discuss. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to move quickly, uh, as quickly as I can, uh, through uh, uh, something of a summary and a little bit of a analysis of uh, what we find in chapters two and three uh, with uh, fear and deception. So um, Last week, we began to talk about <clears throat> Jesus as a person, who Jesus is, what his social location is, what his identity is, how those things shaped uh, his ministry and uh, the way uh, he interacted with those around him, uh, and really positioning Jesus among the disinherited and trying to analyze what is it that, that the, the, the religion of Jesus has to say uh, to those who... Um, who are disinherited by the power structures uh, in the world uh, that we live in. And so he starts uh, <clears throat> with fear 
uh, which is, I think is a, a, a brilliant place to start. Um, and uh, he, he lays out that fear is really a coercive force uh, that's used by those who have power over others to maintain that advantage. That is, if I have power over you, I want to maintain the advantage over you. If I can make you afraid, then I can, to some degree, uh, control your behavior, control how you see yourself. Um, I can uh, force your identity and kind of into a misshapen um, uh, way. And that uh, climate of fear will help sustain the status quo. <clears throat> and fear, this fear takes, takes many forms. I, I'm sure if we begin to think about ways that we are made afraid or ways that we see in our own culture, uh, the disinherited um, being used, you know, fear being used as, as a weapon uh, against them. There are lots of ways, uh, but violence is a primary one. Um, and uh, this fear for, of survival, this fear for our own lives, if I am constantly uh, afraid for my life, then that creates a certain state of being uh, within <clears throat> who he calls the disinherited. And he says, so not only is the fear of death coercive, but it's also, but it's the fear of a death that is without the benefit of cause or purpose. Uh, that is, it doesn't take necessarily any provocation, any reason, any, um, uh, any uh, particular catalyst, uh, other than um, just you know, sort of senseless violence. And uh, if you think about um, the time in which um, uh, Thurman was writing, uh, this was at a time when when lynchings were very, um, <clears throat> were, were, you know, at a, at a high. And so um, that's, that's a backdrop for, to, to imagine what that might be like, to, to realize that that your life is sort of always on the line and that, you know, your life may be taken from you for no good reason whatsoever. Um, and he talks about how that actually diminishes one's humanity to, 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 for your own life to be treated as if it doesn't have the same value as a human life. Um, he also talks about how actual violence isn't necessary. Sometimes the threat of violence is enough uh, to create a perpetual war of nerves. Um, to perpetually be on guard, perpetually be nervous, to perpetually be uh, looking over your shoulder, wondering uh, if if someone is going to harm you. And this this made me actually think back to the time of Jesus. One of the things that I learned about uh, about that some historians say is true about Roman Empire is that actually they would leave the vertical uh, part. Of, we see often in images Jesus carrying the whole cross. Um, but one of the things I've read is that actually the the vertical parts of the cross would stay in place. And, and each person who was crucified would carry the horizontal piece. And so up on a hillside where everyone could see it would be these vertical uh, means of execution so that no matter where you were in the village, in the community, you were always aware and that, that threat of violence was always um, within your periphery uh, and what kind of climate that creates for an empire that is uh, looking to keep people um, <clears throat> in their place. And then he, he talks about how this, this begins to affect um, those who live under this kind of, of climate. The disinherited commit their bodies to ways of behaving that will reduce their exposure to this violence. Uh, fear becomes a means of self-protection. Uh, that is, I, I, I do all of the things that I can do um, to avoid risk. And uh, I'm sure many of us can think about um, the conversations um, that we've had over the last years um, where uh, those of us who, who look like I do uh, don't have to have conversations with our children or with our young people about um, how to avoid uh, that kind of violence, um, but that those conversations happen um, in many, many homes in America for people of color. Um, and I think that's, a, that's an example of what he's talking about. He also talks about segregation or restrictive spaces that confine the disinherited. They're a means of reinforcing weakness. That is, um, you're allowed in your place. I'm allowed in my place and in your place. Um, and so it, it reinforces that, that I have power to go wherever I want to go. Uh, he uses um, worship as an example that 
um, in segregated spaces, a white person could go to any house of worship, but a person of color was limited to their only house of worship. Uh, and so it's that, <clears throat> that constant message of, of weakness. Um, and so he talks about the implications of fear. Fear, while, is, while it is a defense mechanism, uh, we all, it's a human animalistic thing. We, we are afraid of things that will harm us. And, and often that is a means of protection. Uh, but ultimately it becomes a, a death for the self, uh, for my, my spiritual self um, to constantly be afraid um, uh, it takes a sort of spiritual toll. So then the question becomes, what does the religion of Jesus have to say to those who are always made afraid? Uh, and his response is, you're a child of God. Uh, he quotes that passage from the Beatitudes where, where Jesus talks about, consider the lilies of, field, of the field, the birds of the year. Does God not love you more than these? Um, so he says, you know, the disinherited are often made to feel invisible, invisible or have their personhood denied. Uh, but to claim the promise that you are a child of God, that God sees you, that God knows you as an individual uh, can stabilize the ego and, and bring courage. In other words, I, am, I'm, I'm, I can insist on my own personhood um, and my value in the sight of God. Um, and so this leads to the re realization that there are some things that are worse than death. Uh, to deny one's own integrity of personality in the presence of the human challenge is one of those things. Um, and so to, to in, in other words, to, to, to basically accept treatment that, um, that denies that sacred image of God in you, um, he, he argues is actually a reality worse than death. Um, and it also allows a person to see themselves through a lens other than the social predicament they've been placed in by those in power. Um, and so constantly seeing yourself as the object of violence or the object, you know, being made to be afraid and then uh, being invited to see yourself instead as a child of God and as one who is precious and valuable in God's sight is a different lens than the predominant one in the culture that you live in uh, when you belong to uh, the disinherited. I'm going to keep pressing um, into chapter three, which is about coercion. Um, and, and he talks about, or I'm sorry, deception. I should have put deception at the top there. Deception for the disinherited uh, can become a, a weapon uh, to even the playing field with those who hold power to, out, to outsmart or outwit those who have other advantages. In other words, when the, when the, when the deck is stacked against you, you know, using, uh, deceiving the powerful uh, one or the one with all the advantages so um, that uh, uh, you have a chance of, of succeeding or, or overturning things. And when I, when I first started reading, that, I was like, yeah, I love, you know, deception is great. It's, a, you know, to see that sort of that David and Goliath image, right? To see that um, the one who doesn't seem powerful can claim it. But he also talks about <clears throat> deception being a weapon of the powerful uh, to create a system of lies uh, that deprives the disinherited of their civic, political, social, and economic rights without it appearing as if this is what is happening. Um, so uh, to me, what immediately sprung to my mind is the concept of race uh, as, a, as an idea uh, is a deception. It's a lie uh, that was created um, to deprive the disinherited of civic, political, social, and economic rights. Um, it had a specific agenda. This lie was a deception <clears throat> that was uh, presented uh, in order to um, subvert people's rights and and, um, you know, access to, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to use our, our, um, our governmental language. Um, and so Thurman says that deception can't stand. Deception, it, it doesn't matter if, it's, if it, a deception is being used for uh, what we would call good purposes. It doesn't matter if, um, if it's one that's being used to challenge the powerful. That, that in, another, in, in some way or another, deception is always damaging the moral integrity um, of the individual. And so if we're to consider ourselves moral beings and that we have a moral imperative, and this was a powerful line on page 55, to deceive is to become a deception, to lie is to become a lie. Um, and so ultimately he says, this struggle cannot be understood uh, apart from the struggle for survival. Uh, only when people live in an environment where extreme effort is not required for survival are they able to consider other means. In other words, 
when you're just trying to survive, when you're just trying to make it, when you're just trying to get home alive, um, the struggle to think about what is moral and what isn't or what, what has a higher purpose and what doesn't uh, takes on less importance. And so the freedom uh, to really think on this plane uh, does, it does require some, some uh, distance from that constant struggle to survive. Um, uh, he talks about, you know, this is, uh, this prives the disinherited of their full humanity, humanity uh, although in much different states. So Thurman is pushing us toward a more moral existence. Uh, and his answer to, 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 to this is sincerity. Sincerity in our lives acknowledges that we are always in the presence of God and cannot fool God as we often try to fool one another. In other words, we, we want to try to, to deceive other people um, in one way or another for, for whatever purpose. Um, but then he talks about in Matthew 25, we, we see that, that sincerity uh, to one another is equal to sincerity to God. So we, we try to fool one another, but in trying to fool one another, we're trying to fool God. And there's no, there's no point in trying to fool God. God sees through uh, our deceptions. Um, and so we see in Jesus, the ultimate determination, Jesus is not out to deceive anybody. And he's also not deceived. Um, ultimate, he, he is himself. He insists on his own dignity. Uh, he does not compromise that personhood, um, <clears throat> compromise in a way that would have degraded that person. He says, you know, this is, this is who I am. Um, it's a problem for people, but he persists in that. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, he's, he's not deceiving anybody. He's, he's living into that sincerity. Um, and we're going to get to this in a question in a second, but this takes deception as a tool away for the disinherited. So in other words, I'm not using, I'm not trying to deceive to, to get power over the one who has power over me, but it, it replaces it with what he calls overwhelming sincerity. And he says, this overwhelming sincerity, this overwhelming commitment to being real, to being true, uh, to living a moral life. Um, in essence, you are refusing to play the game of deception. That is, that is kind of the, the rules of the game. I'm deceiving you, you're deceiving me, and we just go back and forth to see who wins. Uh, it's refusing to play that game and to just <clears throat> reflect the truth of yourself and the truth of, of what is moral and what is true about uh, who God is and who we are in relation to God, to those who are wishing to perpetuate lies. And ultimately he says, they'll have to deal with the being confronted with that truth. Uh, and then that will be their issue to deal with. So I wanna get to our questions. And this week we are gonna place the questions in the chat before we assign you to your breakout rooms. So when you go to your breakout rooms, you should be able to see these questions in the chat um, and you will be able to, um, uh, to see those and help those keep you on track. Um, so the first one is going back to that fear question. In what ways have we developed bodily responses to manage fear? And he talks about, you know, learning. Uh, if you remember that image where he talks about turning the flashlight on to avoid um, dangers in the night when he was in India um, uh, and eventually that becoming habit. How do we, what bodily responses do we have to, to manage our fear and our risk? And how do those differ based on our social locations? Going back to that concept of a social location last week, uh, depending on what social location you have, you may have more or different or fewer bodily responses to manage fear. Uh, and the second one, second question, Thurman, in talking about uh, death and the fear of death, he does not mention the resurrection of Jesus as a means for, for disarming death's power over us. In other words, Jesus has conquered the grave. There is, there is a resurrection for which I can hope. Death is not the last thing. And so that provides comfort and courage um, to, to believe that, um, that I don't have to, to fear death. Um, but he doesn't discuss that. And, and that might be interesting for, for you all to, just to, to think about maybe why that is. But is it possible to be free of the fear of death without the promise of resurrection? That's, that's one for you to discuss. It does, I don't have an answer to it, but I'll, I'm interested for you to discuss it. Three, Thurman believes that overwhelming sincerity on the part of the disinherited dismantles the powerful 
rejecting the premise on which their power was acquired. What power does overwhelming sincerity carry in a world where so many seem unconvinced by facts or truth? Uh, in other words, he, he's counting on the fact that if, if we are tied, if you remain tied to the truth, if you remain tied to a moral rule, a moral imperative, that ultimately um, uh, the, the, the other side will have to deal with their own deception. Uh, and so I wonder what we think about that um, in our present moment where we seem to be living in a quote unquote post-truth uh, area where um, everything seems to be up for debate even when it's proven fact. Uh, so those are our questions. Uh, I'm gonna uh, put, place those in the chat and uh, 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 Pastor Brickhouse is gonna get us going into our uh, discussion groups. You should have, uh, I would guess close to close to 30 minutes to, to discuss. And so hopefully uh, you will uh, uh, have some things to, to bring back to the group. We will come back to the group, um, ask you to choose one person um, who can kind of lift up one or two things that were interesting in your conversation. It doesn't have to be a summary of everything you discussed. Um, just one or two things that, that stood out or that uh, were important for your conversation in your small group. Um, and then uh, we will uh, share those with one another.